Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for tuning in today. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda Ostern, who is Associate Professor of Musicology at Northwestern University. Uh, Linda is among the world's leading experts on the music of early modern Europe. She just published a new book in 2020 with the University of Chicago Press called Both from the Ears and Mind, Thinking about Music in Early Modern England. Her previous books include Music in English Children's Drama of the Later Renaissance, and she has also edited and co-edited four books that connect music to topics ranging from the Psalms to Sirens to Sensuality and Sensation. Uh, she's published nearly a dozen articles in the top journals in the field of musicology and the field of Renaissance studies, uh, and a similar number of book chapters. And it's my special pleasure to bring her to the OU Arts and Humanities Forum because her work is truly a model of the kind of broadly humanistic interdisciplinary research uh, that the forum is really meant to foster. Linda uh, brings music into dialogue with early modern art, literature, and medicine, among other sources. Uh, she's addressed topics as diverse as childhood, gender and sexuality, the body, nature, and many others. And for me, Linda's work has always served as a unique and compelling demonstration of the connectedness of fields of inquiry, modes of expression, and modes of being. Her talk today is called Music for Health and Healing in Early Modern England. Um, we're going to uh, turn it over to Linda in just a moment. I'll say that um, I really invite you all to, as you uh, think of questions and comments that you want to ask Linda after her lecture, to go ahead and type those into the chat function. Uh, so I'll be uh, bringing those in at the end. Uh, so you can do that at any time throughout her talk if you want. And I'll just uh, ask those to her in the order they're received at the end of the talk. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, I, I wanna welcome uh, Dr. Ostern. Uh, Linda, you can go ahead and start your share uh, whenever you're ready. Well, thanks so much for inviting me and thanks for that introduction. So I just want to make sure that this screen share, I hope you can all see this. Okay, so. On July 7th, 2020, the official online news outlet of Northwestern University featured a story headed, Northwestern Virtual Orchestra Soothes Healthcare Providers. Music is essential during crises. It is part of psychological first aid, Dr. Borna Bonacarpour, professor of neurology at the University School of Medicine and pianist in the featured performance is quoted as saying. He adds that quote, the piece we chose had to be comforting to help with stress relief. Approximately two months previously, Shortly after statewide lockdown, the online health and wellness feature of the university's hospital system had featured an interview with music therapist Jennifer, Jessica Poranfar. She answered questions about the capacities of music to relieve stress and help with the emotional challenges of the pandemic. In particular, she emphasized that, quote, aside from playing a musical instrument, music listening in itself releases endorphins in your system. Furthermore, she explained, research demonstrates that singing releases hormones that can alleviate stress and anxiety and decrease feelings of depression and loneliness. For those who wish to use music therapeutically, she recommends setting the atmosphere for optimal experience. This means dim the lights, make sure the temperature is just right, turn off your phone, get into a comfortable position, and minimize all distractions to use music mindfully and purposefully, she explains. She also suggests adding other sensory stimuli, such as candles, scented lotion, or essential oils to enhance the healing qualities of the listening experience. Above all, she cautions that one must choose music that satisfies personal taste and preference. There's no special genre that works best, so listen to what you enjoy, she concludes. 
Although Dr. Bonacarpour and Ms. Poranthar addressed their remarks to a 2020 American readership using current technology terminology and cultural references, their insights and recommendations would have been familiar to English language readers from four and 500 years earlier. Indeed, music was one of the principal items in what could be considered not only the psychological, but also physiological first aid kit of 16th and 17th century English people across the social and economic spectrum. Their musical instruments, media, and understanding of the human organism may have been different from ours, but fundamentally this earlier era similarly marked by changing technologies, political disaffection, and unanticipated outbreaks of deadly plague, considered music a vital agent of health, healing, and routine self-care. In 16th and 17th century English England, music was far more than a performing art or even one of the seven liberal sciences the educated elite had inherited from Greco-Roman antiquity. Orally and in writing, it was constructed from carefully regulated melodic patterns, harmonic structures, and rhythmic units. It was produced by tangible bodies and captured in distinctive notation, but lacked physical substance of its own. These apparent paradoxes allowed music to bridge the gap between literal and metaphorical, temporal and eternal, and evident and hidden qualities. It brought people together and stimulated both sensory, motor, and subjective response. It served conceptually as the master metaphor for all things harmonious or, conversely, out of tune and temper. Some believed on ancient authority that an inaudible sort held together the visible and invisible components of the universe and the human organism. Perhaps through secret sympathy with these more profound varieties, Audible, performable music was believed to have powerfully affective and demonstrably therapeutic capacities. Physician Andrew Board defines music in a medical manual first published in 1547 as, quote, a science which is comfortable to man in sickness and in health. Composer and music teacher Thomas Robinson emphasizes in the introductory dialogue to his 1603 self-tutorial, The School of Music, that a competent musician must recognize the medicinal potential of his or her art. In the sales pitch for the book, the wise interlocutor Timotheus explains that music is medicinal through its ability to restore concord to mind and body. Now that a musician should be a physician, I see no such necessity, says Robinson's invented character. But that music is physical, it is plainly seen by those maladies it cureth. It cureth melancholy, it much prevaileth against madness. If a man be in pains of any wound or of the head, it mitigateth the fury thereof. And it is said that music hath a salve for every sore, end quote. Two years later, in 1605, natural philosopher and musician Francis Bacon emphasizes in his advancement and proficiency of learning that medicine was fundamentally similar to music. He reiterates that both practices were embodied by the same allegorical figure, Apollo, ancient deity of music, medicine, light, and reason. Bacon states that a physician kept in tune and working order the complicated instrument that was the body, as a musician did for those of his craft. This various and subtle composition and fabric of man's body, says Bacon, hath made it as a curious and exquisite instrument to be easily distempered. Therefore, he continues, the ancient poets did conjoin music and medicine in Apollo, because the genius of both of these arts is almost the same, and the office of a physician consists merely in this, to know how to tune and finger the lyre of man's body, that the harmony may not become discordant and harsh." End quote. So closely were Apollo's twin arts allied and for so long that, some six decades after Robinson and Bacon emphasized their age-old connections and well over a century after Dr. Board put music in his medicinal toolkit, a young gentlewoman lute student still foregrounded such ideas. 
she inscribed in her music book that her instrument was not only, quote, a faithful commodious companion whose pleasing sounds banished the horror and unquietness of environmental and emotional darkness. She added that music was, quote, fit to assuage the passions as choler, sorrow, and the pains that we suffer from diseases and hurts. Music, she said, could also banish sadness, irritability, and the emotional venom that we might call stress or anxiety. In a tradition of which echoes remain in Bona Carper's and Poran Farr's 2020 statements, the conditions that Robinson, young Mistress Burl, and numerous practitioners learned music treated most successfully were those that involved both mind and body. For the early modern era, wellness was largely a matter of maintaining bodily balance, avoiding sources of illness and injury, and choosing from an astonishingly wide range of accepted treatments when any arose. On the authority of the most revered ancient Greek and Roman experts, especially Aristotle, Galen, and Hippocrates, early modern thinkers recognized that health and disease involved three sorts of factors. Those related to intrinsic bodily structures and processes, those related to hygiene and the environment, and those that caused disease. The earliest mass market English language treatise on health maintenance, Sir Thomas Eliot's Castle of Health, opens with a table of these three sorts of things, which he classifies as the natural or innate, not natural or extrinsic, and things against nature or pathogenic agents. Accordingly, wellness was not only a matter of maintaining bodily balance and avoiding sources of illness or injury, it also depended on such, such auxiliary factors as nutrition, air quality, exercise, rest, and mental or emotional state. Writers on medicine and conduct of life positioned health sustaining music as an enhancement to the non-natural or exogenous influences connected to hygiene and the environment, especially air, food and drink, work and rest, and mental or emotional health. Music was believed to rid the air of pathogenic agents and enter the body to expel noxious vapors. Late 16th century physician and naturalist Thomas Moffat explains more specifically that music worked through air to provide environmental purification and consequently healed madness, sorrow, and disorders of the vital organs. These systemic effects of music moving through air, says Moffat, could be enhanced by complementary fragrances, much like our modern music therapist recommends. Dr. Moffat expands to other sensory stimuli and basic salutary practices to emphasize that music had helped the English people, quote, feed much and very diversely since King Arthur's time by prolonging sittings at table and encouraging them to take in a wider variety of nutrients while listening. These salubrious effects were increased by good fellowship and dancing afterward as the music continued. Physician and musician John Case concurs in 1588 that music aided digestion so well that, if used routinely, it could take the place of pills. The combination of music and nutrition was even more advantageous for infants too young to feed diversely or sit at table. Physician John Jones emphasizes in 1579 that a nurse's choice of song affected not only her young charge's emotional state and quality of sleep, but her own psychophysical health and therefore the quality of her milk. An anonymous music treatise adds that the sweet songs and lullabies of his nurse lull a child to sleep and thereby aid his physiological and intellectual development. For those beyond breast milk and nurses' songs, early 17th century writer and scholar Robert Burton recommends for sleep hygiene that an individual should wait several hours after eating, lie in clean, sweet-scented linen, and, quote, in bed must hear sweet music. Music thus works in tandem with objects of the other senses to balance the complete organism through basic daily needs and all stages of life. 
nothing was considered more important to basic corporeal health than regular exercise, such as the postprandial dancing Dr. Moffat recommends, followed, of course, by appropriate rest. Habitual practice of music was believed to strengthen and keep flexible the fingers, hands, arms, and vocal apparatus while training the ear and improving the mind. Such pleasant exercise also provided respite from overwork and related stressors. 16th and 17th century experts agreed that music relieved the tedious aspects of manual and mental labor alike for persons of all ages and occupations from carters to queens. However, much like our modern music therapist, all commentators leave specifics to personal taste, skill, and available material. Such medical inexactitude provided an opportunity for enterprising composers, music printers, and others invested in musical commerce to package mass-produced collections from which purchasers could choose potentially restorative music according to taste. For example, the title page of Richard Allison's eclectic collection of 1606 declares the contents, an hour's recreation in music for gentlemen and others. More precisely, and suggesting celebrity practice, in 1558, William Byrd offered psalms, sonnets, and songs of sadness and piety to Sir Christopher Hatton, Lord Chancellor of England, in the hopes that, quote, these poor songs of mine might happily yield some sweetness, repose, and recreation for your lordship after your daily pains and cares in the high affairs of state, end quote. Twenty years later, Thomas Bateson dedicated his second set of madrigals to, quote, the right honorable Arthur Lord Chichester, Baron Belfast, etc. The highly varied contents, says Bateson, were solely intended for your honor's private recreation after your tedious employments in the affairs of the Commonwealth. However Hatton and Chichester may have used the contents, the suggestion of mental refreshment remained for purchasers of either aesthetically diverse volume. Medical and conduct writers recommended boisterous large scale muscle activities like riding, tennis, archery as means of maintaining health for the well-balanced man, especially those above the manual laboring classes. Music was a frequent complement to these exercises. For example, in a work dedicated to that versatile practitioner of the manly arts and health sustaining practices, King Henry VIII, writer and royal tutor Roger Ascombe recommends music as adjunct to archery and hunting. He especially refers to the exemplary figure of Apollo, whom he says, both merry songs and good shooting delight. King Henry himself, musician and composer as well as monarch and athlete, presents hunting, singing, and dancing in that order as co-equal pastimes in the lyric to his most famous composition, Pastime with Good Company. The repertory in Thomas Ravenscroft's 1614 brief discourse on rather technical aspects of music is organized around, quote, the common recreations that men take, each a classic exogenous influence on health. The boisterous exercises of hunting, hawking, and dancing, plus drinking, plus enamoring. Music's salutary benefits were considered, quote, so great that it refuseth neither sex nor any age, as one sage put it. For women, however, it complemented more gender appropriate exercises than marksmanship or feats of strength. On January 26, 1599, Lady Margaret Hobby wrote in her diary that, quote, after dinner I read, and to refresh myself being dull, I played and sang to the Orpharian. Lady Grace Mildmay similarly recounts in her memoirs a few years later that, as a young bride, every day after reading from the Bible, she spent some time playing her lute, setting songs of five parts to it, and singing psalms. In addition, 
Every day she spent time ministering to the sick under the directions of the best physicians she knew in her capacity as household healer, a conventional position for women of her class. Finally, every day Lady Mildmay complemented the fine motor skills used in playing her lute with embroidery and drawing. Oh, which variety of exercise did greatly recreate my mind as well as body, she concludes. This recreation of mind, combined mind comprised the final exogenous influence with which music was strongly associated, affections of the mind. These arose from interior motions that traversed the thinking and doing parts of the human organism, and they provided powerful physiological reactions. Linking mind and body, they helped the former classify objects and events as good or evil, and the latter respond to this. They were sometimes termed passions, accidents, or perturbations. The relevant pathways of these motions by any name involve the sense receptors, the heart, and sometimes brain and liver, all the Hippocratic Galenic things natural, and the imaginative faculties. On evidence provided by classical physicians in the biblical narrative of David's cure for Saul's madness, Dr. Jones pronounces that, the passions, perturbations, and affections must therefore be moderated by music. Jesuit priest Thomas Wright, professional healer of souls as Dr. Jones was of bodies, adds that the extrinsic influences of meat, drink, exercise, and air set passions aloft, and that music, by virtue of sympathy with the soul, mitigates this. Ravenscroft considers composers affectors whose duty is to move the mind or soul through the sense of hearing. A popular manual for gentlemen from 1589 reminds meters that music cures disorders lodged in both mind and body and renders toxic affect benign, truly psychological first aid, but with added physiological benefit. In such frequent statement by many early modern experts in music, medicine, theology, natural philosophy and conduct of life, <coughs> we see glimmerings of what modern cognitive studies have confirmed. That is, music not only shapes emotional response, but produces detectable changes in underlying autonomic and somatic function. These in turn influence experience and behavior as modern medical practitioners affirm. Music was not only a means to enhance routine life-sustaining practices of mind and body in early modern England, it also helped keep in tune those components which Eliot described as being always in the natural body and it mitigated systemic disorders. For Eliot, as for all heirs of the Aristotelian Hippocratic Galenic system that dominated medical belief and practice from antiquity through the early modern era, the first natural aspect of the body was its elements followed by complexions and humors. These latter were four fluid bodily principles that were especially subject to affections of the mind and particularly responsive to music. These humors were derived from the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air that comprised all earthly matter, and they infused the complexion and all intrinsic aspects of the human organism. Every individual displayed a unique balance between the floor, the four, which were blood, phlegm, yellow bile or choler, and black bile or melancholy. Yet one was always dominant in each person's constitution. Humoral medicine was thus a holistic system that recognized a combination of environmental and innate influences on physiology and personality type. It located emotionality within the body that was, in turn, subjected to its external influence, including music. Physicians and sufferers had to remain aware of individual variation while recognizing the characteristic norms and pathologies of each humoral type. The sanguine, dominated by blood, phlegmatic, dominated by phlegm, melancholic, dominated by black bile, and bilious or choleric, 
dominated by yellow bile. These categories were recognizable by evident physical features and personality traits, including habits of mind and routine behaviors. Medical heritage taught that sanguine individuals were ruddy, muscular, amiable, and lascivious. Phlegmatics were plump, pallid, calm, and dull-witted. Cholerics were fair to yellowish in color, lean, mean, impatient, and confrontational, and melancholic men and women were heavy set, frugal, introspective, and solitary with darker hair and bluish undertones to their skin. Along with appropriate food, drink, exercise, basic hygiene, and social activity, music held a prominent place among routine practices to maintain or restore an individual's humoral balance. Music professionals and physicians not only recognized that specific musical features enhanced each humor and that individuals were most drawn to music that reinforced their natural constitutions. Experts warned that overindulgence in the music linked to one's dominant humor could prove harmful and that the most immediate therapeutic music might complement or even oppose it. What did humoral music sound like? Let's listen to some. In brief, choleric music was Marshall. Moving on, phlegmatic music had the slow, static sweetness of a lullaby. Whoops, I'm trying to get to it. Um, okay. Bear with me, um, the bar at the top seems to be over what I'm looking for, so I'm going to try this again. Okay, so this is phlegmatic music. And the cases of sanguine and melancholic music were more complex, as were the effects of these humors, the two most frequently referenced in relation to music. The warmly extroverted sanguine, dominated by pulsing blood from the heart and a well-tempered brain, was deemed the most well-balanced humoral type. The Songwen's most evident attributes suggested youth, warmth, wit, and springtime, governed by elemental air and the planet Jupiter. Such individuals were inherently drawn toward music, 
mirth and sensory pleasures. According to experts, sanguine music might sometimes prove excessive for those dominated by this humor, but was the best auditory therapy to rebalance all other humoral types. It was distinguished by a steady pulse and what one music theorist called quick notes or triple time, often suggesting dance rhythms. It also emphasized concordant in intervals and avoided lingering dissonance. Sanguine music was marked by long, airy phrases that featured gentle upward motion. In fact, one of the most timeless, culturally widespread sensory motor metaphors is that happy is up, reflected in the steady rising motives of such sanguinary music. And some of you are going to recognize this sanguine song. Okay, um, it's under here. Um, I'm gonna have to do this the roundabout way, I'm sorry to say. So let's do this the roundabout way. And yes, some of you will know this madrigal. Sing me and chant it. Sing me and chant it. The other humor with which music was strongly associated was melancholy. Just as sanguis was more than purified blood, melancholy went beyond black bile. The very stuff of dark and weighty matters of mind as well as body, this humor was associated with Saturn, elemental earth, cool moisture, and autumn as both season and metaphorical time of life. A dictionary of complex concepts from 1616 presents melancholy simply as, quote, one of the four humors in the body, the grossest of all other, which it, if it abound too much, causeth heaviness and sadness of mind. The archetypal melancholic was a brooding introvert with tendency towards solitude, contemplation, and a despondency. But anyone could be subject to excess of this humor pessimus, especially under what we might call stressful conditions. Many cross-disciplinary practitioners and commentators considered music the most powerful, fast-acting remedy. Quote, many and sundry are the means by which philosophers and physicians have prescribed to, to exhilarate a sorrowful heart which in this malady so much offends, reads the best-selling 17th century treatise on melancholy, quote, but none so present, none so powerful, none so apposite as a cup of strong drink, mirth, music, and merry company. Such music works best then among conventional therapeutic compliments. With prescient parallel to our current pandemic, Physician William Bullen explains in 1595 that, quote, Sol sorrow and solitude in plague time bring on painful melancholy, which makes the body earthy and heavy. Music helps against this heaviness of mind, end quote. Fellow physician Timothy Bright specifically recommends to dispel melancholy that the sufferer use tuneful music in triple meter with regular pulse, a very essence of sanguine music. He adds through syn synesthetic analogy that, as pleasant pictures and lively colors delight the melancholy eye, so cheerful music must be sounded in the melancholic ear. However, 
Innate melancholics were wont to shun all things bright and cheerful, including beneficial music. Archetypal melancholy music was more suited to introspection, dominated by relatively slow duple meter, short phrases, downward motion, and with unexpected harmonic shifts and clashing dissonance. In fact, before our current cultural association of the major mode with happiness and minor with sadness, sorrow was expressed by chromaticism or abrupt changes in tonality. Yes, we have to hear some melancholy music now. So slow, dominated by descending motion, full of unexpected harmonies. Increasingly, from the late 16th century through the 17th, melancholy came to exceed its origin in black bile. Reconsideration of the classical heritage and increasing interest in human interiority positioned melancholy in conjunction with a wider range of disorders, especially mental and spiritual, than the other humors. By the late 16th century, the term not only indicated an excess of blackened blood or the burnt essence of other humors merging with black bile, but any malaise of any origin characterized by sorrow, gloominess, or what we would call depression. In spite of its nonspecific nature and varied causes, melancholy remained an extremely serious condition. If untreated, it could result in madness or death. Mid 16th century physician Levinus Lemnius explains that melancholy was sometimes caused by long continued studies, which also stimulated the imagination. Don't we know it? In addition, he says it, quote, most concerns those who manage public employment, such as the two for whom we've already seen music dedicated. Late 16th century physician Thomas Cogan, in fact, points out that, quote, for a mind weary with study and for one that is melancholic as most learned men are, nothing is more comfortable or revives the spirits more than music. Medical and astrological convention furthered a connection between melancholy and the highest level of artistic and intellectual creativity. By the 17th century, the disorder had become fashionable among intellectuals. This trend continued through the Age of Enlightenment as melancholy became even more widely encompassing, doubling back to become as much an affection of the mind as an innate humoral temperament. As melancholy acquired increasing cachet, descriptions and recommended treatments merged with discourses of self-diagnosis and maintenance. Any musician could, and evidently often did, engage in routine self-care for grief and sorrow from at least the 1520s onward. Before the end of the century, writers on music as well as mass market compendia for general self-help applied the stock terminology of healing to music. 
As one music treatise put it in 1588, quote, we daily prove it to ourselves that music is a medicine for our sorrow, a remedy for our grief, and an anti-pharmacon to sorrow. By 1665, a very enterprising music printer, publisher, and salesman recognized a market for ready-made musical pills in the popular and easily performable genres of ballads, songs, and catches. The title page of the resultant work reinforces the Hippocratic Galenic heritage of music's position among dining, drinking, dancing, and merry company, as well as the astrological effective connection of mirth to Jupiter through jovial songs. The idea caught on quickly and the volume went through multiple editions. By the end of the century, the entrepreneur's son and heir expanded the purgative pills in form of witty lyrics set to simple melodies. Fitted to all humors, proclaims the title page, which also includes the verse, he is the best physician you will find that thus to pleasing mirth can fix your mind, that every temper, every sort can please with such variety of songs as these. Beyond such self-proclaimed musical pharmaceuticals for the masses, music books of every sort from the 16th century onward connected the contents to melancholy as a marketing device. Most, such as William Barley's New Book of Tablature of 1596, or John Hilton's Airs or Fall Us of, 17, of 1627, proclaimed the, sections, the selection served as the sovereign salve of a melancholy mind, or could cast out the darkest melancholy. However, as the 16th century drew to a close and both melancholy and sophisticated musical taste became fashionable among the intellectual elite, an increasing number of art songs and instrumental pieces for recreational performance not only included stylistic hallmarks of melancholy music, but referenced the disorder in the title or lyrics. Dr. Bright explains that melancholics are most satisfied with easily discernible meter and melody, except the melancholic who have skill in music and require a deeper harmony. England's best loved composers from the late 16th century through the end of the 17th obliged for skilled consumers. But how could such songs and instrumental pieces work effectively when melancholy was such a dangerous condition? Robert Burton, author of the 17th century bestseller, The Anatomy of Melancholy, explains, quote, many men are melancholy by hearing music, says he, but it is a pleasing melancholy that it causes, and therefore it expels care, alters grieved minds, and easeth in an instant. Psychiatrist W.H. Trethowen has explained more recently, referring to the haunting quality that still loans distinction to some musical works, that such pleasing melancholy may simply be, quote, that degree of effective warmth, which together with despair is so characteristic of the creations of those who really know what melancholy means and which when musically expressed immediately arouses empathy. By way of conclusion, and to tie past back to present, I leave you with a performance of John Dowland's Melancholy Galliard, a sophisticated lute solo that tempers conventional melancholic features with the kind of meter most often associated with sanguinity. Just as the med medical orchestra springing up across the country proved the timelessness of the 16th century commonplace that music hath the salve for every sore, so this ostensibly melancholic piece can still provide a moment of repose to ease our minds at a time of widespread stress.
definitely a pleasing melancholy that it causeth. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Linda, for that, that wonderful talk. Um, everyone, if, if you see it at the bottom of your toolbar, you have the chat function. I'm sure you know already. I'll give you a, a chance to type in any questions you have. I have a bunch of questions, so I will go ahead and, and start with my questions and, and uh, others can think about uh, questions they may have. I'm, I'm interested in, in the relationship between theory and practice here. And so, for example, do your treatises and your, your physicians, do they ever talk about if you have a mixed audience where you've got phlegmatic people and sanguine people all together? And so some of them are being helped and some of them are being hindered by the music played. What a great question. And they all carefully skirt around what kind of music to play when. They leave it every time up to the, the, the choice of the individual or individuals. But where, where you're going or where an answer to that would go is when you look at any of these collections that were marketed to every humor, um, you have to imagine a group of people, you know, whether, um, whether the Lord Chancellor of England or, um, or a bolt cutter or, or iron mender getting together with friends. And if they flip through any of these books, they find music of absolutely every sort including some that very sophisticatedly mix features. So you sort of picture the guys with their strong drink and their merry company choosing. I like that one. I want that one. But wait, he's getting too drunk and having too much fun. We should do that one. Um, or you also picture uh, the person by him or herself with a lute or a keyboard instrument just being able to pick. So mm -hmm. one way the marketing device worked so well would be for um, the songwin whose best friend was phlegmatic and the best friend's wife was melancholic <laughs> and, and her brother was choleric. Um, they could get together and argue. It would be a <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I've got a related question um, from Connor. And so he asks, did each humor have an associated length of music for healing? So for example, uh, were melancholic songs longer than sanguine songs? What a great question. And these pieces range tremendously from very short to very long. Um, the one exception to that is that this very sophisticated, high art, melancholy music tends to be super long and that some of the most sanguine music, whether it's a madrigal or a little catch that a bunch of people would sing together like around, those can be extremely short. So um, melancholics who had taste and skill clearly really wanted to wallow in their pleasing misery. And um, I'm picturing here, looking at some of these collections, sanguine people just moving from one to another to another until they were totally giddy. <laughs> Um, well, I have just one more related comment, which is to say that it would seem to me that all Catholic church music would have been phlegmatic. And so were there any comments that, oh, you, you've got to stay away from church, you're a little too phlegmatic today. <laughs> what a wonderful question. Um, I suppose if there was anything like that, since we have these twin healers of mind and body, um, priests or ministers, and physicians. It might be almost embarrassing if you go to church and fall asleep because that would totally reveal um, that your constitution was being set off. But you're reminding me that among the Anglican supposed majority in England, um, Ravenscroft, the composer theorist I mentioned, he actually recommends different psalms for people of different humors or in a different humor temporarily. 
Um, so he says, if you're melancholy, you should listen to this, and it's sanguine. If you're phlegmatic, you should listen to that, and it's choleric. Um, so there are recommendations for psalms, but yeah, you ask a really interesting question about the important Catholic minority in England, and I'm just guessing they'd be embarrassed to be caught turning over phlegmatic in church. <laughs> Well, I've got another question from Joyce Coleman. So she asks, uh, is there modern proof that pleasant music really does heal? So have, have scientists tested to see whether brainwaves change when a person listens to different kinds of music? Yes, um, this is very interesting. So cognitive neuroscience and um, cognitive psychology have sat people in laboratories and had them listen to music. Um, so apparently what happens is your pulse will move with the pulse of the music, but it turns out there's one um, cognitive music theorist who was really surprised in an experiment that people preferred sad music, sad classical music especially, um, and that that slowed down their pulse and that it altered their brain waves, but paradoxically, it made their brain waves more even. Mm -hmm. So music tends to affect pulse more directly, brain waves more indirectly, and people really like sad stuff the best of all, it seems. So go figure, these early moderns were onto something. That's, that's so interesting. I wonder if it's something to do with the, the parasympathetic nervous system that slowing down the pulse rate is, is you know, activating that um, and calming people down, perhaps. It may well. And it, it then has to do with some kind of empathy that people then feel, which relates to this idea of wallowing in sorrow with your friends. And in fact, some of the most sophisticated music with the word melancholy in the title is for groups of four, five, or six instruments. Um, so you would get together with your friends, each would have his or her own part book, and you'd wallow in 10 or 12 minutes of some long drawn out piece and um, empathize with each other's sorrow and therefore yours would get better. And yes, Shelley, and also there's that old classic rock song, sad songs say so much, and <laughs> our pals in cognitive neuroscience and psychology seem to say, yeah, they do. Yeah, so yeah, so Joyce, for those of you who are not looking at it, put up a, a, a quote from Shelley, our sweetest songs are those that tell the saddest thought. Um, so I have, I have just a related follow up. I, I mean, you're charting in such interesting ways, kind of the emergence of psychology and, and this new connection between melancholic music and psychology. When as a culture, it, it seems like we're now just rediscovering and testing uh, the effectiveness of music therapy. When did we lose faith in it? It seems like there was faith in it for a long time. And now we're just only starting to do these tests and say, no, no, this really does work. So when did we lose faith as a society in music therapy? What a great question. Um, so scholars of the history of music therapy or therapies globally, not just in the West, talk about ancient times. And in the West, there seems to come a gap in the Age of Enlightenment. Um, so somehow from maybe the late 18th, mid to late 18th century into the 20th century, um, this idea of therapeutic music was formally lost but I honestly wonder if it was really ever lost among the ordinary people who were performing self-care. Um, it just got lost out of the medical practitioner's toolkit sometime during the 18th century. That, that makes all kinds of sense. Right, we're almost out of time. I have just one little, another little modern tidbit to add to your arsenal of examples, but there's this whole internet phenomenon of uh, young people 
who've convinced themselves that if they hear music tuned to anything but A at 432, that's the frequency, they get sick. And so they've, they've got these apps where you tune down your whole music library to A432. And, and one of my old friends, Ruth Rosenberg, has written an article about this. Um, but it's just fascinating to me. And, and they, they really do psychosomatically kind of get ill when they hear music at the wrong frequency. And so. that, that's a reminder also, I was going to put some of these on PowerPoint, the limited time here and didn't want to overload your eyes and brain. But you can find all over the internet anthologies of music for sleep, music for waking, um, music to energize you if you're on your way to a party. And there was an old series called Tune Your Brain to Music. So somehow pop psychology is rediscovering what antiquity through the early modern era knew and somehow got disconnected from enlightenment medical practice. So who knew till today? <laughs> well, it's, it's wonderful that society is rediscovering this. And, and Linda, we're out of time, but I just wanted to thank you so much for coming and sharing this delightful talk with all of us. I know it lifted my spirits and I'm sure it's done that for, for the rest of our audience. So thank you again for coming. And uh, thank you all for listening. Well, thanks for having me. This is always a lot of fun and I loved all of your questions. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much.